Well, last week, the state legislature ended its annual two-month session by passing a record high budget. State House and Senate also debated many bills, some of which passed, and others never made it through the process. I've asked all the panelists to choose something that the legislature did that was most significant. It could be a bill passed or an issue ignored. And let's start with Jason Garcia of Seeking Rents. Uh, Jason, uh, what do you think was the most significant thing coming out of the legislature this year? Yeah, I, I'm going to give you two bills just because they were the, the very two last policy bills to pass the Florida legislature this year. And I think it sort of indicates sort of who was really running the show in Tallahassee this year. Uh, the first is a bill called House Bill 433. And if your your viewers haven't heard about this, this is going to do three things. First, it is going to erase living wage ordinances around the state. So these are, these are local laws in places like Miami and St. Petersburg and Orlando that require government contractors, companies profiting off local government contractors contracts to pay their employees just a few dollars more than the minimum wage. That's why they call it a living wage. It will dissolve, this bill, House Bill 433, will dissolve those allowing government contractors to cut wages for employees. It will also preclude local governments from passing any local ordinances to, to, uh, to enact what are known as fair work week laws or predictive scheduling laws. And these are, there are none of these in Florida yet. We've started to see them. They've been passed in places like uh, Chicago and Seattle, Los Angeles. Um, and these are for part-time and hourly employees who work really erratic schedules, many of whom are juggling part-time, two part-time jobs just to make ends meet. The, a predictive scheduling ordinance would require an employer to give their workers their schedule just two weeks in advance, just so they can try and plan their lives, basically. But uh, under House Bill 433, no community in Florida will ever be allowed to adopt a fair work week, uh, a fair week, a local fair work week law. And that's still not all. House Bill 433 will also prevent local communities from passing any heat protection rules for workers. And these are these are local laws. Miami was working on one that would require businesses with lots of outdoor employ employees working outside in extreme heat. So you're talking about like agricultural companies and farm workers or construction crews, roofers, that sort of thing. These heat protection standards would require them to provide basic heat safety measures like just access to cool drinking water, periodic breaks in the shade, that sort of thing. But those will be outlawed. No community, Miami, nor anybody else will be able to require heat protection standards of employers. And so that was all in House Bill 433. And right after they passed that, they passed House Bill 49, which loosened the state's child labor laws and will allow teenagers to work much longer hours in Florida now. And both of these were built around, uh, I think one of the, the panelists said something about the poor economy. It's actually one of the strongest economies we've ever seen because the we have historically low unemployment employment. And, and what that means is the labor market is really tight. Workers have a lot of leverage right now to demand higher pay and better benefits. Both of these laws are designed to undercut that by undercutting workers' leverage to demand more and sort of flooding the labor market with more cheap teen labor. And Jason, do we offer more protection to high school athletes when it comes to heat than we do to workers who are working outdoors in places like roofing and other, you know, very hot jobs? Yeah, we absolutely do. And in fact, for the last couple of years, there has been legislation filed in Tallahassee that would require, it, it doesn't even set requirements. It just requires training for employers with lots of outdoor uh, outdoor workers. And again, we're talking primarily about agribusinesses, farming companies that have lots, mm -hmm. of, people, lots of people working in fields and construction companies, home builders, folks working on construction sites, roofing, that sort of thing. There's been legislation that would just require them to do basic training around how to recognize like heat illness, science of heat stress and that bill keeps failing to pass because of lobbying from the agricultural and construction industries so uh yes we do provide more safety standards for student athletes playing outside the heat than we do for the mm -hmm. folks picking our uh, strawberries and tomatoes douglas soul let's go to you what was the most significant thing in your mind that came out of the legislative session this year well, there's a lot of significant things. I'll tell you that as a First Amendment reporter in the state of Florida, uh, this was a very busy legislative session. I mean, this program would have to be the length of a Lord of the Rings movie to get to everything. That being said, there are multiple uh, things of note. One of them I know panelists, uh, another panelist will get to, which is the social media restriction for kids. There was also a uh, legislative item that would raise the age to work in an adult entertainment establishment, such as a strip club from 18 to 21. And the thing I'm gonna focus on today though, is the chaplain, the school chaplain legislation. Lawmakers uh, in the final days to pass the bill that would authorize school districts to adopt policies for school chaplains to provide support and services to, to kids, to students. 
Now, most of the rollout of that legislation, if it is in fact signed by Governor Ron Santis, would be left up to school districts. That being said, there are some requirements. Um, for example, that the chaplains would have to go undergo background checks. Parents would have to provide consent for their ch child was to see this chaplain. And the chaplains would have to be listed on the school website. Uh, bill mm -hmm. supporters say that it is a important bill for students to address mental health issues and a lack of school counselors across the state. Bill opponents uh, have concerns. Uh, they worry about the constitutionality of the measure, especially uh, when it's implemented at the school district level, if the school district decides to implement it. Um, they worry about the credentials of these chaplains who will be potentially interacting with uh, students with serious mental health issues. Uh, another uh, topic of concern with the opponents, which was a large contingent of Democrats in the state legislature, was that this could open the doors for some of the more controversial religions to have school chaplains. For example, the Satanic Temple has said that it's excited about this law and that it will absolutely take advantage of it. So that is something to watch out for. And I mean, I, I think this is something that if it is signed and, it, and when it is in, enacted in that case, you're going to be hearing a lot about it um, in the months and even years to come. So, so the Satanic Temple will offer its chaplains to college, uh, to high schools and grade schools around the state. That's what they're threatening that's, to do. That's what they. That's what they're, they're saying. They're not even threatening. They're saying that they're already looking to do that. Um, and some Democrat Democratic opponents on the uh, legislative floors also asked about, you know, religious. Uh, ceremonies like animal sacrifices, uh, could you restrict some religious rights and not all? I mean, these are all topics that come up when you, uh, you know, uh, church and state uh, combine. And um, these are questions that will be continued to be asked in school districts and uh, charter schools across the state in the uh, months to come. Douglas, did you cover uh, mental health uh, care spending for uh, for kids under 18? I mean, did the state do anything to advance the amount of mental health care that's available for kids in K through 12? You know, the budgetary side of that I'm not intimately familiar with, but I do know mental health with youths is a huge area of concern for our state lawmakers, whether they're Democrat or Republican or whatever else. Um, for example, you saw that with the social media legislation that put restrictions on it for minors younger than 16. Uh, there's a parental rights component. If a parent says a 13 or 14, a 14 or 15 year old um, has permission, they can't access it. But uh, you know, it still makes a pretty big restriction. And it, it's all was done through this concern of mental health for minors, um, especially following COVID and especially following the proliferation of use of these social media platforms mental health of youth uh, of youths are a huge concern and um, it's something that we're going to be hearing about for many sessions to come. It's something we've heard a lot about this past legislative session. Deborah, what, what do you think was most significant about this legislative session? Well, I think it was the social media bill. One of the, well, the theme of the legislative session was safe, strong, and sound, fiscally sound. Uh, and, you know, following those themes, SAFE was just not in your neighborhood, but it was also in your bedroom or wherever you are watching uh, and, and playing with social media. You know, back in the 30s and 40s, you got in trouble for going to swim in the river. Uh, then in the 40s, 50s, 60s, it was like smoking a joint or having a can of beer if you were a teenager. And then all of a sudden we hit year 2000 and it's social media and it started off quite innocent sharing pictures and so forth so it was a great outlet for teenagers particularly you know their after school hours if they're left home alone so it was a had a positive influence and then the algorithm started and then the big social media companies saw opportunities to monetize um, and they started with and and so you were able to get fentanyl you were able to see porn you were able to 
uh, interact and bully and then started the suicides and the mental health issues. And so therein was the so, problem. So kids will no longer be able to access social media if they're under 16, is that right? No, actually there are some age groups and it prevents 14 and under from having their own accounts, okay? Mm -hmm. A parent can still have an account, a child can still go on to the parent's account. What it does is prevent that age when their brains are not mentally prepared for some of the things that they would be exposed to. Human trafficking, being lured into being trafficked, giving the parents IDs and identity theft. And so then there's some other stipulations and some are on the social media companies, some are on the child and the parent. So then you get to the 16 age group and parental notification, parental rights and so forth so they can have limited access and then you get to 18 where you have unlimited because they believe but it was the FTC the CDC all the mental health organizations who have seen how this has catapulted from a positive to a negative and I must say there was great unity between Republicans and Democrats because it was unanimously voted I think 115 mm -hmm. uh, to 4 so a great agreement. Now the governor did veto the first bill and rightly so. I was a person up there saying, I don't like this bill because it took away parental rights. What I also like is there's a lot of education for these teenagers so they, they start learning the, the ills, okay, uh, the negatives, and, 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 and for their parents. I don't mean to cut you off, Gail, we have a minute. What, what do you think was the most significant item coming out of the legislative session? Um, I think what was significant was the House and the Senate returned to uh, a reasonable method of, of trying to pass legislation where the, the House um, is uh, uh, does the sort of uh, d does the legislation and the Senate determines whether it's going to live or die. Uh, and, and one of those incidents that no one really talks about a lot was they were trying that it didn't it didn't pass, but the Republicans are looking to return to the duo um, primary system because they know that they're going to have a crowded um, uh, primary uh, running for the in the governor's race, and and uh, they don't want someone with 30 percent of the vote coming out the way the the status of the primary system is now. So they want to have a duo primary system that would uh, uh, keep them from having Matt Gates as their as their nominee. Uh, the other thing I thought was really but, but bad. That bill though, failed. Uh, that bill failed, Gil. That bill failed, yeah. but I, 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 I know they'll come back next year. They have to. Okay.